we chatted with James Moores and Court McCumber of Moores and McCumber. We talk about music, origins of the duo, COVID and playing live, one of their latest records, Survival, and what people can expect at their upcoming shows. You can find more conversations, food reviews, live music, and events at our website, lacrosselocal.com. I'm Amy. And I'm Brent. And this is Lacrosse Local. McCumber, the McCumber half of Moores and McCumber. I was born in a little town called Middleburg, Florida, outside Jacksonville, Northeast Florida. I then was forced into music. My mom was a classical pianist, so I had to play piano. And then at eight years old, I had to play cello. But at 16, I have a massive authority complex, so I didn't want the structure of classical music to dictate my life. So I actually stopped playing music altogether, and I didn't do anything else with it until early, you know, when I was in my early 20s in college, started playing guitar, basically just wanted to be good enough to play around a campfire. And obviously I I got to that point. So I feel like I've achieved all of my goals really. And so now (laughs) I moved from Florida to Nashville. I lived in Nashville for a couple of years and realized that, you know, the competition there was great for me to keep working hard at it. But I was also traveling to Colorado a bunch, met my wife out there, met a lot of great musicians. And I loved the camaraderie of Colorado and how they, everybody was pretty open to blending different styles of music. People didn't have to pigeonhole you as much as Nashville, where they wanted to know if you were either a hat act or were you, all, you know, the new country or were you bluegrass or were you just a singer songwriter? And at that point, I'd learned a bunch of instruments. I, I really love blending a lot of genres. And I think that's where Americana music comes in perfectly for what James and I do with a little bit of Celtic influence as well. So I've been in Colorado almost 20 years. So that's my, my journey. And uh, this is James Morris. And I grew up in Burnsville, Minnesota, just South of Minneapolis. And my journey into music probably started with singing in the church choir when I was like maybe seven or eight. And I think I just always enjoyed singing and then growing up, my brother was a drummer and I thought it would be pretty fun to join his band. So then I started to learn how to play guitar and got uh, good enough at that to make it into that band. And then I was learning how to sing and play at the same time. And I figured I wanted to write a song. And once I started doing that, singing my own stuff, I just kind of took off with that. So been singing and songwriting since about 92. Court and I met in 2005. We started playing shows together in like 2010 and we've been recording and um, touring ever since then. It's been a great journey. You knew each other for about five years before you actually came together. What was that process like? Well, you know, we were each singer songwriters in our own right, traveling around the country, trying to make a go of it. And I think we each had a lot of pride in what we had done up to that point, but we also really enjoyed each other's friendship. We helped each other finish songs. We would show up at each other's gigs from time to time and sing and play with one another. And we started to realize that there was some real chemistry that was both exciting for us, but then we noticed that fans were really appreciating it and asking for more of our collaboration. So we kind of took a a turn there and and recorded something together. And that soon became the one thing we could sell at any given show. So we listened to the universe, got wise. (laughs) As like, you know, interviewing, I guess, uh, duos or, you know, kind of a a combo of folks in the the past, is, is there clear, like, do you have similar musical influences or is there, is there some drastic differences in your approach in terms of writing or even just stuff you like? When we first met, that's one of the connections we made was we both loved Sting and U2. And we grew up, you know, when we first started playing guitar and writing songs, we listened to James Taylor and Paul Simon. So we had, you know, kind of a lot of those overlappings that I think a lot of singer songwriters do. So that wasn't shocking really. But then we had some, even some of our contemporaries that we really liked that were currently doing it on a smaller scale and we really respected and looked up to them. That would be like Ellis Paul and Martin Sexton. And we got to meet a a relatively local guy to lacrosse lives um, outside there, John Smith. And that's kind of how we got hooked up with kind of the, the Ireland trips that we do. And then once we started talking about Ireland, we both realized we had Irish and Scottish ancestry. And so that music and the melodies of, of those places really had already been influencing our music and we didn't quite realize it yet. So we had those, 
the commonality there. And like James said earlier, the camaraderie we had together and the friendship, but also how we sang together. And that was also going back to, you know, having listened to Crosby, Stills and Nash and in both of us realizing that we loved harmonies and melodies and how those interplayed. And we were able to pretty much do that together seamlessly. So that was kind of a real, real big connection there that we had. Just kind of digging into you the last couple of days, you know, listening to the, I think one of the latest albums, Survival. What was that process like? Did you have a lot of it recorded before COVID struck? How was that whole experience? I would say we had a, a good chunk of that stuff written as far as like the words, the melodies, the ideas of the songs. But then during COVID, you know, we, we thought it was just going to be a couple of weeks off at first. And then when it became evident that it was going to be months, we got together in Colorado and we hung out at a friend's mountain cabin and we started digging into the songs. And what was different about this record than any of the other records is we took songs that had some current structure and we took them all apart and we kind of rebuilt them using mostly the same lyrics or maybe tweaking them here and there and probably a lot of the same melodies and stuff but the arrangements and the whole structure of the songs were able to change and they did change in drastic ways and so we got together two other times once in minnesota and then once down in texas to do the same thing writing for like a week and then we um went into the studio with those ideas and some tracks that we had recorded in our own home studios. We went down to Blue Rock in Wimberley, Texas, the studio there. And um, we hold up for 10 days with a good friend and you know, producer named Patrick Conway. And he really helped shape them as well to take it to a different sound. I think one of the major silver linings for us for the pandemic was it took us about three months to kind of realize we didn't have control over when it was going to end and when we could play again. So the one thing we knew we could control is, well, let's work on this material and hopefully still stay inspired because I, you know, you heard from a lot of people during the pandemic or, you know, when now that it's kind of waning in a lot of areas, people are like, oh, I wish I would have done more yoga or read more or learned how to play guitar. And my, our whole thing was, you know, that's, it wasn't a sabbatical for anybody. It was survival. And I don't mean that because that's what the record's called, but, you know, like we kind of approached it as if we can, wake up every day and cope we're winning and we were able to stay inspired luckily because we had these songs that were kind of already started and then we were able to like James said rework them into something where we were then able to record them and then we could have something to show for what was happening over the last two years so that was definitely silver lining for us so you kind of touched on before we we jumped on here you know you guys kind of got back into it last summer and you said you're pretty busy what was it like getting back on stage anything different or well it was, it was pretty funny the very first gig that we um went to play it was we have a lot of we have a great community of fans and so what happened last summer is we just put it out to our fans hey if you want to do like a backyard concert we would love to come and we had a surprisingly large number of people reach out and say they wanted to do that so it was great and so a lot of it was outdoor stuff, not the traditional theater stuff that didn't really start till the fall. But the first gig we set up, you know, we had all changed our minds about how we wanted to set up our gear and what gear we wanted to use. Now we were introducing keyboards and electric guitars. Yeah, at that point, we had 14 months to tweak our pedal boards. And, and re- <laughs> we, sh- we shouldn't have more than four days. I think we re- you know, we're like, oh, we can reinvent ourselves completely. It's like, yeah, you still got to go set up and sing and, and play. So we started setting up for the gig and we even about a half hour into it, both looked at each other and we said, what? are we doing (laughs) like this isn't who we are so we we and we had a friend that was watching us and he was like i wish i would have videotaped this because this is it's like you really have never done this before yeah it was really fun (laughs) but we had a great summer like i said it was it was a lot of fun to see a lot of fans you know it'd been a while and i think a lot of people were wondering with that of musicians like what will be like performing again and will it feel awkward you know interacting with people and i tell you the thing i love about humans and human nature is you really go right back into, at least we did. I felt very comfortable seeing people getting back to shaking hands and hugging and interacting and singing and playing. But the one major thing for me, and I think for both of us is, I think it definitely shifted our focus of realizing not to take any of that thing for granted, whether you're playing for 50 people or 5,000, it's like, this is, this might be our last gig. I mean, it's, it, it really does change your focus on what matters. Yeah. People need people. And that was evident last summer for sure. I don't know if it's just something that the absence of it, but going to shows recently, even the last 
year or so has just been fun. You know, it's just like, seems like there's something, something different in the air going to those live shows. So the pump house coming up here, you guys are going to be there. What can people expect from your live shows? I think it's fairly unique. We usually bring about a dozen instruments and court works his way through about eight of them. I handle another four and, you know, we're playing songs from, we've got actually two new records, survival, which is a song based record. And then there's an instrumental record called companion volume one. So we're playing selections off of that. And then, you know, all the uh, fan favorites from the previous record. So that's what to expect. I'd yeah. Say. Acoustic guitars, mandolin, fiddle, cello, electric guitar, keyboards, so a quite a wide variety of stuff, but it's kind of, it's all anchored by the songs, the lyrics and the harmony singing. So that's the one thing that, you know, our strength is definitely the singing and the songs. And then we color it with the different instruments. It's not, you know, we try to make it as seamless as possible for sure when we're switching instruments, just because the idea of the, all the instruments is not just, you know, flash and smoke and mirrors. Hopefully it's, it actually is what colors, it's what colors the songs. You know, if, it, if we're playing an Irish, Irish-ish song, it definitely sounds great when James is playing the Irish bazooki, which is an eight string big mandolin and when I'm playing fiddle. So it's like, we kind of try to color the songs to fit the lyric and also the singing. So is there anything interesting coming down the road you're excited about? I know you're going to just got off the road, but you're going on tour again. So well, Court and I else? are, we're considering joining the circus. Awesome. We both <laughs> have wanted to be trapeze artists for a long time. And I'd Why like not? to chainsaws that are on fire. The but... thing that James forgot is I think the age limit's about 21 for that <laughs> stuff. And he already gave away that he's been playing since 92. So uh, well, I, well, let's see what's coming up. We, well, the we Pump House are, show, obviously, Pump House massively show. excited about. I, I love that space. I love that town. It's got a very Irish feel to it to me. It's a lot of pubs, yeah. which is, is why I feel very uh, at home in Wisconsin, as I do in Ireland. Pubs <laughs> per capita is an impressive thing in your state. And then we are looking forward to Ireland again in May because uh, we've missed out on taking our fans over there. We usually do four trips a year where we take mm-hmm. fans and friends and sightsee and listen and in, in learn about Irish traditional music and dance and the history of the people. So we're looking forward to that in May. So if people want to check, you know, stuff, stuff out like that, what's the best avenue for them to follow along your website or social media? Website, moresandmcumber.com. Lacrosse Local Podcast is a production of River Travel Media. Do you have an interview idea you'd like to share with us? Message us on Facebook at Lacrosse Local. Find out more about us at lacrosselocal.com. And you can subscribe to the Lacrosse Local Podcast on your favorite podcast app. If you like us, rate us five stars. We appreciate it.